So I know we've got some really bold thinkers here on the stage that represent many different areas of science and engineering, and I want to pick their brains. So I gave them some questions in advance about things that I really wanted to ask, and I hope that we can have an open conversation. We also have some microphones so that the audience can ask questions as well. But let's introduce our panel, and I wrote them up here in alphabetical order. So our first panelist is Professor Yo-Yo Fan. She's a professor in civil and environmental engineering, and she's also a program director at the National Science Foundation for the Directorate for Civil, Mechanical, and Manufacturing Innovation. Our next panelist is Professor Vladimir Filkov, who's a professor in computer science, and he's also the director of translational data science for the Data Lab. Our next panelist is Professor Donna Mazette, who is our Vice Provost for Grand Challenges. Um, she's also the Chancellor's Leadership Distinguished Professor of Epidemiology and Disease Ecology. And um, she's the Founding Executive Director of the One Health Institute. Our next panelist is Professor Vinod Narayanan, who we just heard some really exciting work that he's doing in renewable energy and storage. And he's a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering. And he's also the associate director of the UC Davis Western Cooling Efficiency Center. And our final panelist in alphabetical order is Dr. Elizabeth Wheeler. And she is the bioengineering and detection group leader at Lawrence Livermore National Lab to give us a little perspective from the lab partnerships with the universities as well. And before I launch into some questions, I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page and we know what the grand challenges are. So it's really exciting that the campus has decided to put a lot of resources and thought into tackling the wicked problems that we really have at the moment in time that we have to start addressing. Very much with our uh, strategic research division for the college, now is the time to act for climate resilience, for energy, for health, and for mobility. And of course, bringing in AI and ML, et cetera. So it's really the moment in time where we have to make some impact to change the ship and make sure that we have a sustainable future. So the grand challenges uh, that Professor Mazette is overseeing and stimulating are about sustainable food systems, reimagining the land grant university, the climate crisis, and emerging health threats. So we've heard a lot about that in, from some of our presenters today, and we'll just open it up for a broader conversation. So I'm going to go ahead and kick it off and ask a couple questions, and then maybe we can open the floor. So my first question is for John. So uh, John is the founding executive director of the One Health Institute. And One Health is this very transdisciplinary perspective that we're all in it together. The people, the planet, the environment, the ecology. We can't have health of one without health of all. And it's really a very visionary, transdisciplinary effort. So my question is, how did you envision this major effort of One Health? How did you grow the initiative and how did you get it funded? It's very much in the spirit of doing new things that aren't on the radar yet. <laughs> well, I'd love to take credit for One Health, but I, I can't. Um, actually, on this campus, we've been doing One Health since the late 50s, early 60s. We just didn't call it that. Um, so one thing I think that is very special about this place is we are trained often across disciplines or in more than one school or college. So I actually went here. I have four degrees from Davis. And um, that's not very diverse, right? <laughs> but but um, one of my degrees in epidemiology was I was trained by the medical school, the veterinary school, the division of statistics, and um, and nursing was involved, and so and nutrition. So it and it, it was a one health training program before anyone called uh, any training programs one health. Um, and so when we started to see that our efforts were. Um, well, I, I want to go back to your point, I said that we battle and feel like we're pushing the boulder uphill when people aren't like-minded or the funding agencies don't have big programs in these areas. So I was quite happy to get 
awards of $10,000, um, things like that when I was starting my career here, um, trying to piece together all those little awards to get the pilot data to be able to do something bigger. And so with One Health, I think um, the world started to sort of catch up really around Ebola and Ebola outbreaks. It started to become something people were saying. Um, uh, it's all just One Health was in the New York Times. You know, our health is the planet's health. So um, while we were already working in that realm, what we did that I think was a little more what you're giving me credit for is we jumped on that before it was what World Bank is talking about now and what WHO is talking about. About 15 years ago, we jumped on that and said, we should have an institute here for One Health. We've been doing that on this campus for decades. We need the, to get the recognition and the visibility for what we're doing. And that turned into several hundred million dollars worth of work. Um, so when the agencies decided, oh, hey, this One Health thing is good, we better do it, there was a One Health Institute. And so we were a top contender. And so I think it is what you're saying. It is doing what you do because it's the right thing to do. It's what the world needs. And it's what you are trained and have the passion for. But looking for those strategic opportunities to be ahead of the curve and know that something's coming. And um, anyway, one way, one way I'd really like to see us advance is not just be ahead of the curve for funding, but actually be, like you, the place where those ideas stimulate the funders to build programs around it. And I think uh, almost every faculty member and graduate student and postdoc that I've met here at Davis has those ideas. It's just that we, we kind of keep quiet about them. We kind of are a very humble, collaborative campus, which is awesome. But it means that those agencies are not necessarily hearing from us. We're not pushing the envelope. We're not getting DARPA to, do, to, to build their programs around what we're doing. We're waiting to hope that we can do something that they're going to fund. And I think we can flip that narrative. I think that's really wonderful. We've been talking a lot about being proactive in the college and instead of reactive. And we've heard that from some of our talks today, too. So we want to be the ones who shape the national agenda and sort of respond to the national agenda. Exactly. So let's make that happen. All right. My next question is a little more practical for Vladimir. Can you tell us about Data Lab and how faculty and graduate students can get involved? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for having us here. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very glad to, uh, to be a part of Data Lab. It's, it's uh, the uh, hub for the Data Science Central for UC Davis. Uh, we have uh, multiple different ways in which we interact with uh, uh, faculty and students. Uh, we are really a, a community builders, so we do build communities. We have research and engagement clusters. Uh, we invite each of you to come and join. We, we have many on our uh, website. And we can start new ones. Anybody can start a new one. These are really interest groups around the research. Uh, another way in which we can engage is uh, we have faculty affiliates, student affiliates, uh, postdoctoral affiliates. We also have faculty fellows uh, uh, that are uh, merit-based, honorific, and uh, they, they, they are people who serve Data Lab for a number of years. Uh, startup projects are another way in which we interact with the uh, campus. Uh, Data Lab is funded by the provost and by internal grants and external grants, and uh, some of that money uh, allows us to dole out uh, resources to people, including data scientists, uh, computational help, etc., uh, to work on your research project for about 10 to 12 weeks. And uh, any PI can apply for these. Uh, they're usually not very uh, selective. We have uh, basically we can support most of them, and uh, you know you get uh, time and, and money to create a, a prototype or a proof of concept and then apply with that your plan. We also kind of like a recharge service, so you can buy out time uh, if you need it right now, right then, or we can be partners on a proposal. We also have a lot of uh, teaching, the non-traditional teaching activities where we teach workshops, uh, uh, we train people in various things, uh, you know, we participate in Data Love Week, which is around 14th of February, uh, <laughs> where all of you see uh, 
put up all sorts of workshops, and uh, uh, yeah, so we, we participate in that. It, it's an amazing, you know, beehive of activity at that time. Uh, so yeah, we invite everybody to come and see us. We do teach a few of our own classes, uh, bachelor's in data science for undergrads, and we are planning to start uh, another class for uh, health data science uh, to train some of the fellows on, on that side. We're actively working with the health system, so uh, it is a process, especially me, uh, that's in my portfolio. We are happy to work with uh, everyone, and we encourage everyone to come and visit us. We have working space for students, uh, if nothing else. We are next to the books on medieval magic, so you know things are going to work out. Uh, in the library, so. Yeah, come and see us. We're on the third floor of the library. Thank you, Vladimir. So it really seems like it's a nexus where a lot of cross-campus collaboration can happen. And Rob, I think that's part of this panel discussion is how do we build the connections across the different colleges and the national lab partners to really take advantage of all the brilliance that's here. OK, my next question is a little practical, too. Yo, yo, you just are doing something that's very unusual. You're an NSF program director. And I think most of us don't really know what that means. So could you tell us a little bit about your role as an NSF program director? Um, I, besides the roles that, um, responsibilities that most of our colleagues are familiar with, handling proposals, talking to PIs, uh, <laughs> responding to uh, their requests after declines. <laughs> Um, I spend most of my efforts on building research capacity. And that means that uh, I try to find the resources. I try to find the resources for new directions uh, through organizing workshops, through um, um, helping with major infrastructure uh, building. So for example, uh, when I got on board, I noticed a lot of proposals were rejected uh, on autonomous vehicle automation related topics because uh, they rely on purely simulation. So apparently, the research community needs a testbed. So I, it took me two years to first figure out how to find, uh, how to come up with the money because my core program doesn't have that much money. And convince people to chip in and then uh, find a right team to build that uh, major research facility. So those are things that I do over the last three years. Thank you. That's really very impressive and very important for the rest of us in the community that you're there and it's uh, helping shape the agenda. So we're grateful to you. Okay, my next question is for Elizabeth. Um, I know that you're at Florence Perma National Labs. And I was hoping that you could tell us about research priorities at the lab that align with our strategic vision focused on energy, climate, health, and mobility. Sure, I can do that. Um, the national lab, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, is one of 17 Department of Energy national labs that are out there, and we are a, a multi focused lab. And we're not like a single focus on particle physics, for example. Um, so there are many different programs at the lab, and there's about 8,000 employees out there, so I certainly can't speak to all of the programs and projects that are going on out there. But there is a striking resemblance between some of the key focus areas that you guys have identified here at Davis and that we have at the lab. We've got bio resilience is, is a big focus right now. How are we going to be prepared for the next pandemic? Because as someone said, you know, clearly that it, it's going to come. We just have to be ready. A uh, big focus right now on climate and energy. I mean, how do we make sure we have the resources we need? How do we protect them? So all of those areas are very similar, and I think there's a lot of synergy between them that we can get the right uh, professors hooked up with the right principal investigators down at the laboratory. Thank you. I hope this is the start of a more collaborations between us. Right, I'm going to change the tone a little bit and start with you, Vinod, on this one. So. What types of bold research do you envision are going to be the future for the energy sector? Um, when you think about energy, there are two sides to the coin. One is how do you produce energy, and the other one is how do you uh, use energy. So there's a production side and the demand side. Uh, there are challenges to each one of them. So I talked a little bit in my, uh, in my thinking minutes about some challenges on the production side, transitioning to renewable sources. 
uh, how you have this uh, thermal storage, I mean, how do you have energy storage in general, can we do anything more than electrical, can we do chemical storage and so on. Um, electrical storage and to some extent thermal storage is shorter term, so it will get you through the night for maybe a few days. But if you want to think about seasonal storage, then you're thinking longer term, and that's where the bigger challenge is come. So think about, you know, if you if you were completely uh, all electric homes, and you have these rains in California, how do you get past those rains uh, uh, if you have just solar energy as your source of uh, energy? Um, the days at a time when it's rain, when it's not solar, how do you store that energy uh, on a seasonal level? So that's where I think chemical storage and things like become important. So that's one aspect of it. On the demand side, uh, we can do a bunch of things. Uh, there's a lot of work uh, currently on load flexibility. How do you move the demand of you know, uh, your electrical appliances uh, from peak uh, to off-peak times? So both of these have to come together in terms of you know, uh, long duration storage, short duration storage, but also load flexibility on the demand side to make this uh, and, uh, this work in terms of renewables in the grid and not having to rely on fossil fuel. Thank you. So John, I'm going to ask you a similar question, but we know what your grand challenges are. They're, They're not just mine. They're yours. I just wrote them down. The sustainable <laughs> food systems, reimagining the land grant university, the climate crisis, and emerging health threats. So I was wondering if you could tell us how our faculty can get engaged with grand challenges, since we have a lot of common interests not a lot of connections with us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so Grand Challenges is a brand new program. Um, and the way that we identified these Grand Challenges is that I did a listening tour um, with as many people who would talk to me, but I, I almost you know, twisted the arms of the deans and many of the associate deans of research of the different schools and colleges as well um, as just different sectors all over the campus. Uh, and we decided that what we needed for our grand challenges were problems that anyone on this campus and in our community would say is a wicked problem that needs, uh, needs more solutions, that lended itself to the need for collaboration across disciplines. And, and I mentioned my pandemic preparedness work. Well, clearly we had a pandemic, right? It didn't work. And so I feel like on that one, there was a failure, and a part of it mine, um, because I recognized the need for this One Health approach or the interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary collaboration, but although we brought in social scientists, for example, we used them for working with communities and community-based engagements and making partners. We did not use them up the chain for policy and talking to our leaders and making sure that the leaders had solid plans so they knew what to do when um, faced with this issue. So that just reminds me that we wanted these problems that we would make campus priorities to have the ability for every school and college to participate. Um, and then um, finally, they should be things that we have enough really great horsepower and brilliance around that we can help make better solutions, propose better solutions. Um, and so while we um, were doing that, we started meeting people and trying to bring people into the tent. And I can tell you engineers are involved, many engineers with, with uh, all of these, except maybe, I don't know if I have an engineer yet for reimagining the land grant university. And if anybody wants to talk about what that is, we can talk about it. Um, uh, but I don't want to use the panel's time. So you can certainly email us, grantchallenges at ucdavis.com. EDU, you know, not very exciting. You can email me, jkmazette at ucdavis.edu. But really what we're doing for each of these grand challenges is we're starting having campus community meetings. And so don't just throw it to spam when you see grand challenges because we're probably inviting you to bring your passion and your brilliance to the table to talk about how we might build better solutions. Um, and as we've been progressing, there have been targets of opportunities like big NSF grants, and we use those lists that people who show up and meet with us and talk to us to start to proactively build teams, 
people volunteering, I could PI something on this, I could PI something on that, I'd love to be a collaborator on that, wouldn't be my um, area of expertise to lead, but I could help from this piece or that piece. So we're building those teams, those ideas, so that we're ready when those calls come, because some of these big ones only give you four or six weeks to write the proposal. If you're just then building your collaborative team, you're way behind. Um, so that's one way you can bring us ideas, you can nominate challenges, though I, I feel like I have my hands full with these first four. But I'm really thrilled that they come from the grassroots, they come from our campus community, and our chancellor and provost immediately bless them as campus priorities and are really putting their backing and their money um, uh, where that, I don't want to say where their mouths are, but you get my So please get involved. Come to meetings with us if you have time. We're doing them hybrid. You don't have to show up in person if you don't want to. Um, but we love it when we have that um, in-person energy as well. So emailing grand challenges and sort of giving a bullet point list yeah, of just, the areas that you're most interested yeah, in. Yeah, I, I work on these like things. I'd like to participate in this grand challenge. Let me know what I can do. That would be the first one. Um, but, but as it builds out, it's really becoming very active. You're seeing certain people, Michaela, you wanna, he's one of our champions for the climate crisis, so um, you can email Michaela. <laughs> um, and so we're, we're looking at funding opportunities, but also activities that push policy and get us into the front lines um, and, and help to create programs. Thank you. I know I've been involved a little bit with the wildfire round tables. And they're just really vibrant discussions. It's great opportunity to meet really brilliant camp faculty from across campus. So lots of great reasons to be involved. Great, so uh, Vladimir, my next question is for you. What types of bold ideas and research do you envision for data science, artificial intelligence, especially with respect to our priorities on health, climate, mobility, and um, energy? Thank you. Uh, I uh, just wanted to say we are very happy at Data Lab to be part of yeah, the grand challenge. Yeah, I wanted to get Data Lab more. Although we do have a much more alliterative uh, email, Data Lab at UC Davis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we are very happy to be working on this, and uh, Data Lab itself is really focused on the, on the on the social aspect of things, and this is where I see the progress and the bold ideas. All these grand challenges are really, you know, a, a romantic period. Yes, we have challenges, but then we are thinking the audacity to think we can solve this is really fantastic. And I think AI jumps right in, helping us. We can be audacious because of all these new tools that we have. So really the big ideas are solving the big challenges, right? Uh, but let me just be more, more precise. I actually have a cheat sheet here uh, that I prepared a little bit. One thing that I'm really excited about is how do we design our lives around being much more efficient? having a smaller footprint on the environment and yet having a higher quality of life. AI can get us there. Uh, AI can get us there through the technology. So we don't have to stare at ads all the time. We can, you know, we can go on vacation in a PR by simulating the environment without incurring a lot of cost for driving, for example. Uh, uh, it can be very appealing. I was in Las Vegas actually doing a fly over a mountain where they had this amazing uh, spherical setup where you, uh, you lie down and you fly over, indistinguishable from reality, the resolution. And then when you get into the clouds, they spray you with water, so you actually feel like you're in the clouds. They blow wind over you, where, and they move the thing, so you feel like you're falling, and it's scary. You can actually produce these things nowadays with the virtual reality and, and, and AI. Uh, Another thing uh, where I think uh, uh, we can really win with AI is smart living, not so much, uh, so kind of like smart aging, but even before you start aging, you can do a smart living. Uh, you can live smartly by uh, uh, emphasizing the goals you want to have, uh, so be more efficient at work, have more time at home uh, with the family. You can do smart living by not aging as much, by taking uh, for example, any vitamin C at 4 or 3 p.m. And maybe AI can tell me that. So understanding our bodies uh, in, a, in, a, in a very bespoke way for each of us, AI can allow us to have this. Not just about healing, but about living uh, better through AI 
And I know that we have a big smart aging initiative here on campus. They're building a, a thing in Colson where we can be uh, actually experimenting with those things. Uh, but, but underlying all this, and I, you know, I have to say the negative side now, underlying all this is better use of data. Unfortunately, uh, the forces that actually own the data uh, own the data, and they don't want us to better use their data, right? So I think to, to really step into the benefits that AI can give us, we have to be a bit uh, actioner, okay? We really have to create an infrastructure like open AI for all, not the open AI, one word, right? That is not really uh, for all. We should uh, let everybody be able to do the modeling, uh, the large language models, for example, chat, GPT, etc. There was an initiative that just resulted uh, this week in a, in a model you can run, a chat GPT you can run on your own personal computer. You can download it and run it there. You don't have to depend on cloud services. In fact, we have it up and running already in Data Lab. Uh, uh, so how do we make AI work for everyone and not just for the few that, that own it? So I think we really need an investment in open, uh, open AI and methods. Could I just top up that Data Lab collaboration for with the Emerging Health Threats Grand Challenge is using AI, and we're so thrilled to have the expertise to help us target what might be the next pandemic. So getting ahead of the pandemics um, is certainly something we all want to see, and that's just a good example of how um, we're working together to, to use AI and machine learning specifically uh, to help us. Just a quick minute, thank you for that. Just a quick minute, I was just at the Internet Archive, actually. It's a library that stores the Internet historically, the Wayback Machine. We had an event there, and it was amazing and very sad to me to see that four different publishers, large publishers, are suing uh, the Wayback Machine, and they want to shut it down uh, because of their IP, so they're getting very bold. Everybody who owns a piece of the data is getting very bold and wants to own it forever. And it's very easy to, for somebody who has a lot of money to just say, I'm going to buy this part. Any negative comments there are offline. So, and they can restrict it. We cannot allow that to happen. Uh, this is, the Internet Archive has been in, in, in business for 40 years, and they're trying to shut it down. It's, it's sad. So, but my point is, if we, if we do it properly, we can benefit. Thank you. Those are really great points about having more bespoke lifestyles and also, you know, we saw this with the advent of the Silicon Valley companies that a lot of people made a lot of money without the public interest in mind. And trying to reclaim that is really a great thing that we should be thinking about. Yo-Yo, I'm going to ask you a similar question about bold ideas. So what types of bold ideas do you envision being of interest to the directorate at NSF that you are um, a part of, especially with respect to our strategic research vision priorities? Um, I recognize two kinds of bold ideas. One type is uh, bold fundamental ideas. Uh, that doesn't require a lot of uh, collaboration. It's just maybe a single PI came up with a very interesting idea that no one has, very few have thought about it. Those kind of bold ideas um, it tend to not be so specific to certain application areas. At least what we see uh, at NSF tend to be very fundamental. Uh, the other kind of a bold or grand challenge that requires tremendous of an effort for synthesizing uh, different knowledge pieces from different disciplines that often requires uh, uh, some seed funding right, to initiate and also collaboration effort and so on. Uh, for within the CMMI division, uh, we see most bold, bold uh, <laughs> um, ideas of, at a fundamental level tend to be aligned more uh, at either bio or material level kind of inspiration. So for investigators that are out there, um, we have what's called laboratory directed research and development funds. And so these are funds that um, principal investigators at the laboratory can apply for ideas and it can either be at a high level or big projects at a strategic level or they can just be kind of crazy scientific ideas. 
So one of the hats I wear is I'm the chair of what's called the lab-wide LDRD committee. And it's a committee of scientists from across the lab, and anyone can, can propose an idea to that committee. We evaluate it, and if it meets a certain bar, then we would fund it. So that's a great way to fund it, uh, to, to work with laboratory employees, and a lot of those, a lot of those projects have subgrants to universities because we realize that there's so much great research going on, we're certainly not looking to reinvent the wheel. We want to leverage that as much as we can, both from research as well as from pipeline, right? We're, we're doing massive hiring out of Long Stream National Lab, so we really need that pipeline open and people to know who we are. Because a lot of people we know don't know who, who we are in the research that we do. So LDRD, uh, those are internal funds, so they're slightly easier to get than, for example, if you're applying to NIH or, you know, if you're, applying to DHS, other funding sources, so that's one way to kind of get started. Uh, we also have many sabbatical programs, so our staff can take sabbaticals and go to universities, and we also have uh, faculty come to the laboratory over the summer so that you can learn about you know, the techniques that we have and the research that we do as well. So there are many ways to, to start fostering those, those collaborations that we do. We'll take effort in, I think the key thing is starting them early and sustaining them as long as we can. Thank you. Well, since I didn't ask you the both question, <laughs> So I'll speak kind of from my area, which is sort of the bioresilience. We're seeing a lot of the bold ideas coming from the intersection of different disciplines, right? So right now there's a big push for getting as much data as we can from all the biological experiments we're doing, and then tying that into the computational models. The idea being to get predictive biology so you don't have to do those models. Now that's many years out, but getting, getting that data to validate the models is one of the key things that we're working on now. So that we can, you know, take any all of the data that's out there from you know, electronic health records, monitoring what's in the atmosphere. You know, can you get to the point where you're going to identify that next pandemic right as it's starting? And then taking that, can you then develop that countermeasure that you need so much more quickly than we've seen it done in the past, right? So for that, you're going to need the human model tissue systems so you can do that validation study. You're going to need to know, you know, how everything kind of interacts together. So really, it's, a, it's the intersection of the disciplines is what we're seeing. Thank you. And we know that to enact any of these changes, we need partnerships with policymakers and industry players as well. And we know in his. Uh, there's a question. Oh, there's a question. Please. Is it okay? Yeah, please. Yeah, I've been mean, using this word bold a lot. And I'm just kind of curious what the panel, how you would sort of define bold. There's other words that go along with. Um, Maybe we should like we're talking about like a disruptive technology, maybe a high risk technology, maybe a very expensive, you know, to launch. Uh, can it be cheap, short, long duration? What do we actually think about? What do you guys think about when you use the word bold? I can I can answer uh, both up. Uh, I I see it as a high risk, high risk, high reward kind of uh, technology or solution. It doesn't have to be technology oriented. Yeah, could it be a process? Could it be a way of thinking? Things? I, I think of bold as uh, something that not too many people are doing, but it's going to affect a lot of people. I would probably say it's something that hasn't been tried before and it has a chance of failing. I think that especially on like the committees I sit on, I don't think enough research fails quickly enough. So I think we're not kind of pushing that, that leading there. what is really 
um, the end goal and how can we make an impact and then work backwards and see what is the challenge in engineering or science that's preventing us from going there. Not only that, a lot, there are a lot of <coughs> technologies out there that can work for the challenge that we have. How do you get it to the market? So there are market barriers and option barriers that we also look at. So um, in, at the center, we are mission focused. So okay, how do you uh, use the energy demand? How do you increase the efficiency? How do you get yourself off the peak road problem, for example, in California and, and um, in a broader con context? And that requires us to talk to uh, IOUs, which is the uh, PG&Es and, uh, and so on, and also companies that have bold ideas. We have our own bold ideas. We also have to talk to the Energy Commission, the State, see what their goals are, and 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 lead at some uh, at some level and say, okay, this is what this is where we should be going. Uh, for example, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Priyasar Pispatini, has been working a lot on uh, ventilation in schools. And as a result of her work, uh, there's an assembly bill that was passed two years ago that has mandated that uh, the schools go back and look at their ventilation requirements and put sensors to see what the safety levels are and so on, so that uh, we make sure that uh, you know, the students or our kids in classrooms uh, we read the editing of the pair and the right of the pair to the ICO to um, And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's both science, but also um, we need to work with uh, policy makers and with industry and uh, to make sure that whatever we are doing is relevant. So keeping everybody in the loop. Everybody has yeah. to be in the loop, and then we have to also look at market barriers, adoption barriers, there might be really neat technologies, but it may not go anywhere because of some key barriers that we want to look So we need to engage with you know, the communities, the stakeholders, uh, to make sure we understand their perspectives. And trying to have forums where all these people come together is a big Oh, challenge. absolutely, yeah. How do you do that? So we have, you know, we, we have our set of affiliates, which include uh, <clears throat> the uh, utilities, uh, the energy commissions, some um, out, out of California, we are trying to broaden our perspective beyond California, so we have uh, other uh, utilities as well as uh, national labs and uh, a lot of companies. Uh, and so we have uh, affiliates forums, we have local energy managers meetings every year, and then we have uh, our own steering committee that is twice a year and tells us whether we are in the right direction or we need to change course. Change, change so getting more engagement from different players. Absolutely, yeah. yes. That's right. yeah. Yeah. So are there any questions that the audience has? I have a couple more questions. I, mean, I figure we should run until 4 or 5 since we started five minutes late. So I have a few more questions about um, how to raise the interest of funding agencies and how to build great interdisciplinary teams in an organic way. So, Let's start with the um, how do you raise the interest of funding agencies to fund their own ideas. So I know we can visit our program managers and maybe have some symposiums and start writing the papers. But what do you think are the most effective ways to help steer what the funding agencies are going to be interested in? So that's a general question for everybody. Uh, I can go first. Uh, I'll keep it a story short. Um, now 3D printing is uh, popular, uh, many disciplines are actually using it. Um, I, uh, one of my favorite uh, stories about funding, engaging funding agency is that very early on, uh, when it's still considered as bold, uh, and I started to start funding it as an uh, exploratory uh, project, um, and then took more than 10 years for it to actually be convincing that there is potential vacuum out there. Um, and then the reason that uh, the agency was willing to continue funding after five years not seeing any major breakthrough was that the funding agency, uh, the program director actually visited the school and then uh, interacted with the graduate student who was passionate about it. And that actually made a difference. Uh, so uh, the program was willing to continue uh, another four-year funding on that project, and that made a huge difference. 
So I, I think uh, there are ways of uh, engaging funding agencies' interest, not just from the faculty, from the young, talented, graduate students that also make a difference. I'm happy to jump in. Um, in the One Health arena, what we ended up doing was taking um, one thing that we wanted to achieve uh, and going to several funding agencies with their piece. Um, that is not efficient, but it does work. It's hard on the PI though. You're writing at, um, so many grants and you really have your one thing you're driving, but you have to report on all the things that each of those agencies or funders wanted. It does work, but it is a very labor intensive way to go about it. Um, I think now uh, we have the, I, I see laughing like others who have done the same, uh, but it does work. Uh, other um, mechanisms that work really well, I think, first of all, go talk to your legislators. So if it, it, it's best in our system, you should be invited, um, but you can uh, be invited and you also as a citizen can go visit um, your, your agency not representing, I mean, your, your representatives not representing the university, but representing yourself. Um, the more that they hear about Davis and what we're doing, the more you will be invited. And we do have our own government relations office, so I would highly recommend you work with them. They have scheduled whole visits for me um, in Washington, D.C. to go to the different representatives and the different committees and the heads of the staffs of those committees. So I highly recommend that you do that. And you can do that through Brandon Minto in our office here. Um, we also have the um, UC Washington, um, which used to be UC DC, sort of still is, I don't know what we're calling it exactly, but UC Washington is what I hear them use as the new moniker. So we have a whole um, a group in DC that just does that for UC. And so again, you need to go through our office to get on there plan, um, but that's a really great way. Another thing that's been suggested to us in Grand Challenges is that we might help um, folks write op-eds. So op-eds can be very, very powerful. They're not that easy to get published in the highest level, um, like New York Times, LA Times, all those. Um, but if you can start to get op-eds, so you get a slow news day and they take your op-ed, this is a very powerful way to get in front of policymakers and agency heads. And so we're thinking about, I won't say we're committed to it yet, but we're thinking about providing some ghostwriting services um, for op-eds so that your ideas get into the right hands frequently. Um, and so that, that's another way. So, so um, all of this is hard for faculty members, though, especially junior faculty members, trying to stay on target, get their papers, get their funding, to ask them to step up and, um, and sort of lead is a big ask, I think. Um, uh, and so we, as a university, need to come together and make the system work for them and work for all of us uh, and be easier. So that's what we're looking at for grand challenges. So again, email us those ideas that you have that might be helpful in this room. Yeah, I just want to uh, emphasize again what Yoyo said before uh, about the grassroots approach of you know, uh, bringing people together and keeping these Rolodexes active, uh, networking, meeting people, building coalitions, understanding what everybody wants and not just yourself, right? And, uh, making it into a bigger effort uh, when, when needed. I, I, I have been organizing communities uh, for a while now and uh, it's amazing how receptive people are when the thing you're talking about is important. So, uh, you know, uh, it's more difficult to go about it by yourself. There's one more. I, w I just want to compliment Yo-Yo because uh, not everybody will sort of take time to do what you're doing and um, be a program director. But we do have the opportunities. They come to this campus all the time. I know of DITRA. I know we have one. One of my high-level, PhD-level staff members is now a DITRA program manager, but work, still works for UC Davis. We succumb to DITRA. So we do do that on this campus. Um, and it is very powerful um, when we have people in, um, uh, sorry, I should say Defense Threats Reduction Agency. Is anybody part of the um, Department of Defense? But we do 
we can do that. We do have mechanisms. If you have the interest or one of your staff or postdocs or someone has the interest, we do have the ability to keep the, the folks in the system and building their retirement and all that, but succumbing to the agencies to be in these positions. It's very powerful because they bring their UC Davis network with them and ideas, right? Um, and that helps to get them in front of uh, the priority line. I'm glad you mentioned Ditra. One, one of the ways I think uh, has been really useful is to, to invite uh, program managers or, or even colleagues who are doing similar work from other universities to come visit us and show, show them what you're doing and, and, and that has a big impact on the, if it's a colleague, they might be on a review panel that uh, they were something closer. If it's a program manager, they went for meetings that they did not know before. So I think that's a very powerful way of, uh, I think we should just get some mechanisms in place into the funding to invite people, give seminars and, and have more than just a seminar, you know, meet the faculty and talk about So maybe some of our next level research team funding, then you could go in that direction. And by the way, Zoom doesn't work well. <laughs> <laughs> just a very quick tip. Uh, the most cost-effective way of bringing a funding agency, I mean, to, to meet with funding agency representatives is just bring them to campus because by, by the uh, conflict of interest rule, uh, program directors have to pay their own trip. So the funding agency will pay their trip, cover everything. We just needed to organize the event. I've been going to many, many campuses to give outreach talks or talk about new in initiatives and so on. I've been uh, telling my staff colleagues, oh, I've been going to all those campuses. I cannot talk about these funding opportunities at my own home institution, this is not fair. They all agree to say, oh yeah, you just need to send us an invitation or go there. <laughs> so we can invite you. <laughs> That's interesting. I know I could talk to you all afternoon. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to throw out one last question there. Um, looking back, with all the experience that you have right now, what do you think the toughest challenge has been about the <laughs> I mean, I'm under my eighth investigation of the origins of the coronavirus because I'm a coronavirus researcher. So I've had the FBI at my house, I've had the President of the United States direct people to come and harass me. So, yeah, that's the worst. Well, <laughs> I can't compete with that story. <laughs> <laughs> but you should still want to do this job. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I, I still hear, I'm still here. I'm still wanting to. But, uh, but yeah, sometimes there are real surprises. And again, I think about the policy piece that we in STEM often don't consider enough. And I think if we did a more holistic job, a lot of that would go away. Um, I want to share my own uh, change of perspective. Uh, it wasn't the toughest challenge before for me because uh, my, my focus wasn't on uh, direct impact to society. I was pretty much uh, motivated by my own intellectual curiosity. So I was just happy either way, or whatever that inspires myself, I was happy to work on it. Uh, so it wasn't a, until I took the NSF job being really inspired by many talented, very talented scholars who actually were able to translate their research results to directly benefit uh, the society. So I imagine when I come back to the campus, um, not only I have to change my mentality, I already changed my mentality, but I would actually face challenge in uh, taking that extra two or three uh, steps to translate my research to uh, communities or society, which will require different uh, skills maybe not alone by myself, so maybe leverage the institutional support. So that might be the toughest part, uh, challenge for me uh, uh, moving forward. I, I think uh, one of the tougher challenges happened in, in computer science in the past uh, you know, five, ten years, which is you, know, you cannot compete with the big companies' uh, investments. 
in the very same, same area where you're working in. And then uh, you really have to understand who you are and what makes you tick and how to train students in the gaps, uh, creating open infrastructure versus a closed one. Uh, so reformulating what you do in many ways uh, and making it work again. Of course, in many ways, the companies are funding some of that, uh, but then, you know, finding out who you are again is really challenging. So, I think periodically we all need to reinvent ourselves anyway, so that's a good, good thing. I'll just add again, so um, I do a lot of big, large team research with people from all different disciplines, and I think sometimes it's actually the people that is the hardest thing, right? We're doing very challenging science, but keeping everyone focused on one goal can sometimes be difficult, right? So you have a go off and do a great application over here, but what we're working on is a deliverable driven research, so making sure we can deliver on the same time, and then kind of worrying about the complications. So sometimes uh, the dealing with the people can be challenging, keeping it on the same page, and uh, focus on the same goal. I have a lot of other questions about how you build teams organically, what are the tools you use to manage the teams, when you cut your losses, but I know we're getting to the end of the time. So if you all would like to make any kind of closing comment at all that you'd like us to leave here with, please feel free. But not, uh, I'm not insisting that you do so. So opportunity for people to share any comments that they feel would be useful. Question? Yeah, just one question. Alan has a mic. Yes, it's uh, both a comment and a question, but it's also something that has been uh, uh, coming out multiple times during this panel. Uh, both the bold ideas and the building connections uh, are not really something uh, that the universities uh, are built uh, to do and to work correctly, because they require a lot of effort, and this has been coming out uh, multiple times. And usually they are not the most efficient way to pump it out uh, papers uh, and get in citation. Because the more bold is your idea, the more alone you are, the less citation you get. <laughs> so why are we working as the higher education institutes with the, the policies uh, and the priorities uh, of the for-profit uh, publishing uh, companies instead of setting up uh, what we really want to do that is uh, helping the uh, society to better themselves. Um, I would say faculty and university want to do it and are doing it, but it's not the best way to do a career in a university. So how can we align better? I mean, what is already happening to align better uh, these two requirements? Thank you. Well, I just want to say one thing because it's also the answer to your question, and it feels like uh, we had this conversation in your plan for me, um, but, uh, <laughs> we did not. Um, but I do, um, if that's what our reimagining the land grant university challenge is partially about, it's also about social justice and acknowledging how we got here and who we took, took it from. Um, but uh, but also, how do we become solution oriented? Because if we are just following the model of centuries of European structure, traditional structure of universities, then we don't have in our American promotion system and other things the pro types of products that actually help to solve the world's problems. So culture change is slow, but there's a group that also includes global affairs and public scholarship and engagement that are all looking at um, and following on. There was a great panel. Uh, committee that the campus um, commissioned to really look at Meriden Promotion and say how do we actually more clearly value in our Meriden Promotion system um, the kinds of public engagement and deliverables that we need to change the world. And, um, and the great news is there are no impediments to that on this campus. There are no rules. The only impediment is ourselves. So it's truly a culture change. It's how we vote on each other. Um, uh, is the only impediment. So for some schools, colleges, and departments, it, if you don't have a single author book, you're not going to move through the system. We have to rethink that, and um, and really, uh, there there's all sorts of movement, 
um, and actually Yo-Yo could probably comment. Even the agencies are helping us out now because NSF is putting in their large awards that you have to show that you're doing something for merit and promotion um, to, to make the activities that they want to fund actually work for us as faculty. So, um, so thank you for letting me plug a little bit what reimagining the library first. Yeah, um, I think Makali uh, raised a very good question. It's time for us to start thinking how to redefine the university's uh, primary roles besides the usual uh, stuff. And I was at a workshop just uh, a couple of weeks ago on uh, uh, smart and connected uh, communities and, and, and so on. And then data-driven AI came up very uh, frequently. But then there was always a question, uh, who should own the data, uh, which entity we should uh, trust, and so on. Right, so building the trust in the AI and so on. And then university. So at the workshop, there were people from high tech uh, industry, from government, all sorts of uh, level of government, and the university and so on. And then university was always the entity that the people uh, from all uh, levels, all, all sources would trust, right? So I think being a, either regional or national uh, think hub and, and motivating uh, public driven uh, interest related research and facilitate the interest the benefit of the public is what universities can do. I'm very glad that the funding agencies are actually getting in on the uh, on funding infrastructure, which I think is very important infrastructure. What I mean by that is, you know, I work in open source software communities and uh, nobody wants to fund the maintenance of the software, which is very important for research software to keep going uh, and not the bugs. But until recently, uh, NSF would not fund such a, such a thing. Until recently, the university would not recognize such efforts, for example, as, as uh, worthy of, of tenure, etc. Uh, but things are changing, and I'm very glad. And there are many good people working on infrastructure, and the university should just get their foot off the brake and just let us do the, the thing that many, many good people work on that. So there's this amazing group of faculty and thinkers. Does anyone have a last question that they'd like to pose? Maybe just one thought about um, how faculty evaluate each other and how we reward each other for life grant institution. I think it's going to be really important to keep in mind that we are the source of uh, training doctoral students. And so that high risk, bold idea of how you value it has to also um, somehow be consistent with our how we train um, you know, tomorrow's PhD students. And that's not so easy either. We sit through qualified exams constantly and try to de risk projects so that we actually get their PhD. And then that need risks our entire lab. And so that's kind of an awkward balance. Yeah. I'm not sure I have the answer, but just want to make sure that's still part of the conversation. Great. Well, I see we're at 420 right now. So let's thank our panel for being here.
have healthy aging and digital health without thinking about human behavior. Uh, we want to thank Keysight Technologies, and Colin is here today representing them, and they've been a really great partner to the college, and Origin Materials is here as well, and uh, as well a growing relationship at Lawrence Livermore National Labs. We had a Sandia visit last week that really created some new partnerships as well. Um, we had our UC Davis Chile uh, affiliates here visiting earlier today. They had to leave as well. And uh, the Grand Challenges, it's really great to make more connections. And with the Office of Research as well. Thank you, Whitney, for being here. And Anna Lucia was here earlier today. And they're really our forces for interdisciplinary research on this campus. So we're really grateful for everything that they do. We are going to have uh, more activities to advance our strategic research vision. So most people are aware that we have two faculty searches going on right now for the strategic research vision college-wide. Lots of interesting logistics around that one. We're going to have to make some difficult decisions about prioritizing what hires happen since there are many college, more and many departments involved in this decision. Um, and then we're going to do another round of seed funding. And the plan is to have some meet and greets for lightning talks centered on each of the four principal areas, energy, health, climate, mobility. So they're going to be on Zoom, and we'll have some, uh, we want to facilitate people coming together and forming teams. And then we will have our pitch desk probably in late April. We're trying to get our referees on board. So once we know the referees, we'll be able to um, announce the dates. And of course, the themes for the pitch desk are what you've seen, energy, climate, health, mobility, quantum, tools at the micro scale, AI, ML, Internet of Things, uh, and engineering for all. And we're probably going to do something more structured. We are going to do something more structured this time. So we'll have the same general seed funds that we allowed for this first round of Pitch Fest. You heard the amazing results from that today. Um, but we're probably going to have some more categories as well. So the symposium series were very successful. Like everything that Chen Yi has done has really built a lot of bridges with the School of Medicine and launched a lot of new research investigations and proposals. Um, and we are going to also do some seed funds for identified large grants. And um, we, thanks to our donors, Susan Ellis and Mark Linton and Leanne Hartman, who is our foster in all of our relationships, um, we have funds dedicated for microbiome research that we will more than likely partner with the School of Medicine on. And we're really looking for these cross-college collaborations, like I was saying, integrating engineering, health, and social medicine and human behavior so that we can start addressing these problems that are really at the moment in time that we have. So that's all I wanted to say. We have a reception. We welcome you to leave comments or brainstorm. So there's some uh, uh, boards, these post-it boards around, markers, write down your ideas of things that we should be pursuing. There's post-it notes as well. Leave us criticism. Uh, any kind of feedback that you have, we're very welcome to. You know, we're trying to learn from this first round of seed funding in order to make it much more impactful. So please feel welcome to give us any kind of blunt comments that you'd like or to brainstorm about things that you'd really like us to be investing in. And I really want to thank everybody for their time. And before I wrap up, I want to thank two people in particular, and that's Alan Wakefield. coming together that, as the note said, didn't even know other people existed in our college, right? This is what this is all about. We cannot tackle wicked problems without bringing bright minds from with different expertise together. So I'm, I'm really excited about this. And thanks to everybody for being here. Thanks to Risa, Alan, Paul, and, and everybody for showing up. Yeah, thank you for coming. We really appreciate your feedback and your enthusiasm and your great ideas. Let's thank our panel again.